Another day, another sorry what tale. Hello, my dear viewers. This is your favorite storyteller Jason. If you're new here, welcome. Now, strap yourself in because we're diving right into today's story. Part 1. My associate and I had been working on this project for just over a month, and we were now ready to conclude our business. Everything in place, no detail left unattended, we were ready to pull the proverbial trigger. As we walked into the hotel bar for a nightcap, we perused the setting. There were a handful of business travelers at a variety of levels of inebriation. Nothing unusual in that. I was looking for conversation, my compatriot chose solitude as we seated ourselves at different ends of the bar. He chose a seat closer to the door, and I went to the corner at the far end, dropping down on a stool next to a 30-ish looking guy. He was well dressed, tall and had good looking features. I've always been an excellent judge of character even when casually sizing someone up. This guy was full of himself and confident he was the smartest guy in the room. After receiving my glass of Michter's 10 year single barrel straight rye, I struck up a conversation. In town for business. Yeah, two day quick turnaround sales meeting you. Yep, just one day for me though. Headed home in the morning. Where are you in from? Miami you. Dallas. I don't mind coming to Minneapolis this time of year. It's so ducking hot in Texas in July. My name's Nick. He held out his hand. Nice to meet you Nick, I'm Brody. Interesting name. Don't think I know any Brodies. Jaws came out the summer of 75, my dad was a huge fan. I was born that full, and he named me for the Roy Sheeta character, Sheriff Brody. This led to several minutes on favorite movies, sports, drinks etc. It was clear after a few minutes that my original observation was correct. Young Mr. Nick was mostly enamored with himself. Whatever movie I mentioned he had a better one. Great scotch. Nope, his was better. Being a curious guy by nature I just let him talk and brag about himself for the better part of an hour. When it was clear his tongue was loose, and his brain was still telling him he was on top I switched subjects. So, Nick, how about women? I don't see a ring, so I assume you're not tied down. You're one girl kind of guy or do you just go with the flow? Duck man, let me tell you about the greatest gig in the world Brody. I leaned in letting him know I was genuinely interested. Married woman. That's where the action is. Single gals are either so uptight they won't even look at you, or so full of themselves they wouldn't know a good duck if it was standing right in front of them. Really? But how are married women different? I assumed if somebody was married, they'd at least try to be faithful. Ha. Huh. Are you kidding me? This isn't the 1950s, and you're not on leave it to beaver pal. Most of the married women I've met when traveling for business are back at home in Dallas, love the thrill of the mystery man. The idea of getting some deck behind loving hubby's back is such a turn on, even the sweetest soccer moms I've met have screwed my brains out. What about the husbands? What about them? Hell, if they can't keep the wife satisfied, she's going to find someone who can. Maybe they're a good lover, but she just wants to spice up her life. The older ones, in their 40s just want to know they're not over the hill. As long as you know what line to feed them and which way is up when ducking them, they just melt in your hands. As for the husbands, why should I give a duck? This is intriguing, let me buy you a drink, I want to hear more. Sure Brody, you drink a fine whiskey which tells me you're a man of the world and can appreciate what I'm seeing. I motioned the bartender over and he refilled Nick's glass. I was enjoying sipping my mixture slowly. Nick was hitting it a little harder. Instead of savoring my $50 a shot whiskey he was gulping it down. Young punk I thought as I continued my inquiry. So do any of these conquests of yours end up in divorce court? I'm not keeping score, but I'm sure some of them do. I've only been caught a couple of times and I don't stick around for the outcome. I'm in it for the kitty, not looking to steal a guy's wife. My only interest is ducking some hot, ready to trot slot and getting my rocks off. If she gets kicked to the curb, what the duck do I care? Even if there are kids who get caught in the middle. What the duck, Brody, are you my priest or my drinking buddy for the night? I'm not out to hurt any kids, but if some mummy wants to jump my bones and roll around for a couple hours, I'm in. Like I said, these married or are some of the wildest witches on the planet. Okay man, I'm not judging. Have any recent examples of ones that turned out shaky? He grinned from ear to ear. Yeah, about 4 months ago, I'm back home in Dallas at a local watering hole. Several women come in together. Looks like one of those girls nights out. Everyone is wearing a wedding ring and at first, they hung together, just drinking and laughing. But I can spot the horny ones a mile away. If you know what to look for, it's easy. Anyway, I'm checking them all out, but I keep coming back to a brunette who has beautiful auburn hair and these big brown eyes. She looks to be one of the older ones in the group. Turns out she was 42 and, as I said before, beginning to wonder if she was still sexy. 
She was hot as duck, tall with long gorgeous legs that stopped at one of the sweetest bums I've ever seen. Nice tits to boot. I mean she was the whole package, and I was getting some flirtatious smiles back when we made eye contact. So, I wait until one or two of the other women were asked to dance before I made my move. You don't ask first. You want a woman who may not be desperate, but one that is looking for someone to tell her she's beautiful. You want the one who is nervous that she hasn't been picked yet. They're the easiest to duck. Anyway, she says yes to a drink and then a dance. Before too long, she's in my arms, grinding on my clock and panting in my ear. I take it slow, lowering my hands, but not going too far too quick. But after a song or two she's pretty in my hands. Now I know she's mine. We leave quickly and head to a hotel across the street where I proceed to give her the ducking of her life. I mean she's wild for it. Blue job and me eating her, the missionary, followed by her on top riding me. Then in the shower, before me bending her over the desk panting her from behind while spanking that unbelievable ass. All the while she's groaning, or talking dirty to me, duck yes, duck me harder, duck my married kitty you big clock bustard. If you like vocal, and I do, you are in heaven. At this point, Nick takes a breath and collects himself, perhaps realizing he's getting a bit too worked up. He pushes up from the bar stool, let me take a leak, and then I'll finish the story. You're not going to believe what happened next. While well, Nick is gone, I order us two more shots. My associate approaches looking bored. Anything exciting or unusual? He asks nonchalantly. Nope, different day, same song. I reply. Think you'll be ready to call it a night pretty soon. Yeah, I think all Nick and I are on our last drink. Without any further conversation he returns to his spot at the end of the bar, orders a Mitchell Bolter, and begins scanning his phone. Nick returns. He picks up the glass and drains it without thanking me. He's getting too drunk to think of such cultural niceties like manners. So, you were saying? Oh yeah, so suddenly there is pounding on the door and a guy shouting, Open up Mandy, I know you're in there, open this door immediately. He must have had some kind of tracking device on his phone. Mandy was hot, but certainly not the sharpest pencil in the box. She just looks at me and whispers, Oh no, oh no, it can't be it's my husband Carl. She begins to sob and hyperventilate and all I'm thinking is, I've got to get the duck out of here. He's pounding, she's wailing and I'm dressing as fast as I can. I'm ready to scram in under a minute, so I fling the door open and try to push my way past hubby Carl. He grabs at me, but he wasn't a big guy, and I can handle myself okay. I push him up against the wall and hold him there for just a second. There is a blinding rage in his eyes. Settle down Carl, I don't want to hurt you. I don't know you, I just met your wife and I'm leaving right now. I give him a strong push and he falls to the floor. I'm out the door and down the hallway before he can do anything stupid that would lead to me kicking his ass. The last thing I hear heading out the exit is her crying, it's not what it looks like. Now I'm laughing my ass off as I run. Not what it looks like. What a stupid witch. It was exactly what it looked like. Mommy out for the night getting her brains ducked out, cheating on her husband because she wanted a thrill. Nick smirked as he finished his story. Don't know what happened, and as I said, I don't care. I got the kitty I wanted. Sweet little Mandy got the hard ducking she needed, and Carl got the short end of the stick. But that's the way the cookie crumbles, right brody old pal? I guess so Nick, I replied looking at my drinking partner while perfectly hiding my true feelings. We sat for a minute or so in silence when Nick began to swoon back and forth on his bar stool. I grab him and balance him in place. Easy there Nicky boy, I think you may have had one too many. You okay? Man, your whiskey is getting to me. I think I better hit the hay. He tried unsuccessfully to stand up. I caught him before he fell and balanced him against the bar. You have your room key Nick. I better help you get to bed. I don't think you'll make it on your own. Yeah, thanks man, he said, fishing out his room key. 419 if you don't mind helping me to the elevator and room. Not a problem. Happy to help my new friend. I nodded to my associate who understood and went to pay the bar tab, while I ushered drunk Nick up to his room. When I got him through the door, I dropped him on his bed. Thanks brother, I really appreciate the help. I normally handle my liquor better than that, but tonight I guess I'm a lightweight. By the way, Brody, I never asked you what you do and if you ever get any sweet kitty on the side. I almost felt a tiny bit of pity as I looked down at him. He had such a stupid grin on his face. He looked ridiculous. Well Nick, I have a unique job. It is very lucrative and can be a bit dangerous, but I do pretty well for myself and am always careful with my work. Nick seemed to be struggling to pay attention, but I must have piqued his curiosity because he stayed with me another moment or two. Okay, so what do you do? I am alive people Nick. Ha. Very funny Brody, come on man, what do you do? 
I sighed heavily as I pulled a chair over to the edge of the bed and sat down, knowing Nick would be unable to move much right now and not at all in about 3 minutes. I unalive people like you Nick. People who do hateful things to others, often destroying their lives and the lives of the people around them. Tonight, I'm working for a gentleman named Carl Danvers. I believe you met him several months ago in a hotel in Dallas. Nick's eyes began to widen with fear. He tried to sit up but couldn't. That's right Nick. You ducked his wife, but more importantly you ducked over their lives. They're headed for divorce, and three innocent kids ages 7, 9, and 12 are about to be part of one more broken home statistic. Carl found me through a friend of a friend of a former client. By this mutual contact he asked me to balance the scales of justice. He knows his cheating skunk wife will have our joke of a legal system in her favor, so there will be no justice in court. However, he has enough resources to ensure justice is served on a piece of sheep like you. Carl has crushed Nick and you did that to him. His kids are devastated. His wife decided instead of dealing with her guilt, she'd tell him to get over it. She was entitled to her fun. Maybe he can't do much about that whore, but he sure as hell wasn't going to let you off the hook Nick. So, as I said, you knocked Carl for a loop and ruined his family, but they will all be alive tomorrow and can try and put some pieces back together. You, on the other hand, will be very unalive in about 10 minutes. You shouldn't drink with strangers Nick, especially if you're going to duck women who belong to other men and leave your drink unattended when you hit the head. Damn, Nick you were just too ducking easy. I may have to give Carl a small refund. Nick was gurgling now, trying to speak, but he couldn't form the words. There was a soft knock on the door, and I left him briefly to let my associate in. He took one look at Nick, we good here. Yep. Nick was down to just a couple of minutes. I smacked his face to revive him. Nick, listen carefully. I'm the last face you'll ever see on this earth, and I want you to know it is the face of a man who loves his work. Nick's eyes fluttered then closed. My associate and I took several minutes to wipe everything down. It didn't matter, we weren't in a hurry. The cops would look at the tapes after the body was discovered, but they wouldn't find a thing. The two men on the surveillance camera in the bar and on the hallway camera seen entering this room looked nothing like their real identities. 90 minutes later, our professionally designed disguises removed and burned to a crisp, we boarded two separate flights. His for Montreal, mine for Bozeman, Montana. The job done, we won't speak again for a month or two, when the next job comes around. Right before takeoff, I sent a quick text to a man who would text another man to text yet another man to deliver a three-word message to Mr. Carl Danvers in Texas. Trash taken out. Part 2. Carl Danvers closed his burner phone after receiving the message, trash taken out. He'd be sitting in his office waiting for word that Nick Santos, the piece of sheep who ducked his wife was no more. Carl handed his phone to one of his assistants who was working later than he wanted, but knew his boss would take good care of him. Destroy the set, and then head home to your family. Give your wife my love and take tomorrow off to make it up to her. No sweat boss, she understand things crop up from time to time, she's good. Carl handed out an envelope with two tickets to a private tour of Van Gogh exhibit that was opening that weekend at DMA. I know Kathy loves art, so you two have a fun day on me tomorrow. I'll see you on Monday. At Tanner turned and left smiling at how lucky he was to have been found and employed by Carl Danvers. He knew Kathy would be thrilled which meant he'd better call his mom and ask if they could keep the kids tomorrow night. He knew his wife would show her man her appreciation and he wanted her attention to be uninterrupted. Carl Danvers was a child prodigy. In high school his IQ was tested and scored at 166. Albert Einstein had an IQ of 160. Danvers was brilliant, and his parents taught him to be a hard worker. The combination opened door after door for Danvers, while it caused fits to anyone who went up against him. When he was 12 his parents sat him down and explained to him how gifted he really was. It didn't surprise him or make him clocky. He'd always known his brain was exceptional, and he just took it as part of who he was. Nothing to brag about and nothing to apologize for since he did nothing to earn it. He was simply born that way. During the conversation his parents stressed the importance of being responsible for the gift he had been given. Their words included a demand that he remain humble and kind. His father stressed fidelity and trustworthiness while his mom drilled down on kindness and ethics. Both agreed emphatically on one thing. Be mild. By this they meant, strength under control not weakness. His dad put it this way. Son, be the guy who takes care of the people around him, but also be the guy who demands fidelity of himself as well as family and close friends. Never tolerate betrayal or deceit. Being played a fool is a sign of weakness, so never go looking for trouble, but never allow anyone to take advantage of you or wrong you without setting things right. Carl Danvers had taken this lesson to heart. He'd lost a few fist fights along the way when he stood up for himself. 
He wasn't some big bad mother ducker who could crush anyone in his path, but he was a guy who would fight ferociously and get back up, no matter how many times he got knocked down. By the time he was a freshman in high school, even the local young thugs respected him enough to leave him alone. But Danvers had always enjoyed using his mind more than his fists. He could out-debate anyone including most of his teachers. He was in AP Calculus class his senior year at a prestigious private boys' school, when the teacher made a serious mistake on a problem he was teaching. Carl saw it right off but didn't say anything until after class. Excuse me Dr. Sims, but could you spare a moment? Sure Carl, what can I do for you? Carl went to the board and grabbed a piece of chalk. After about 10 minutes the teacher gasped. Well, well Mr. Danvers, you caught my mistake and corrected it. But why didn't you speak up in class? I've always been taught respect and kindness Dr. Sims. You are consistently more than fair with me, so I want to treat you in kind. I had no interest in disrespecting you in front of the class, and I knew once you saw it, you'd recognize it right off. From that day forward Carl and Dr. Sims were lifelong friends. And that was how Carl lived his life. He accumulated a wide range of associates and friends who respected and appreciated him. He went to Princeton on a full ride and graduated in 2.5 years with dual degrees in history and finance. During this time, he found he enjoyed the mental challenge of ideas more than math or science, so upon graduation, he headed back to Texas and attended Utah Austin Law School. Again, on a full ride. Utah wasn't in the top 10 law schools. It ranked number 15 in the country. However, Danvers knew he wanted to practice criminal law in Texas. It was never too early to begin making connections and networking. He finished number one in his class, and had no fewer than 20 law firms around the country, offering him the moon to join their firm. He turned them all down except one. Martin and Milner of Dallas. They were known to be some of the toughest criminal defense attorneys in the country. M&Ms as they jokingly called themselves were not the largest firm in town. Total staff was comprised of only 57 souls. There were six senior partners including the founders, Thomas Buddy Martin and Travis Milner, both born and raised, proud, gun-toting fourth-generation Texicans. The other four partners were Miguel Fernandez, Hannah Proctor, Judd Chandler, and Mia Carlson. The rest of the crew consisted of four junior partners, 20 law associates, nine paralegals, six research techs and 12 admin assistants. 90% of their workload was criminal defense, with the other 10 going to various pet projects of the senior partners. In January of 2005 the senior leadership gathered around their conference table, for what most thought would be a long grueling selection process, with each senior partner tossing in their candidates for the three new associate positions that would open in the spring. Everyone was surprised when managing partner Milner walked in and dropped the bomb. Everyone put away your candidate files and listened very closely to me. Eyeballs darted around the room. Everyone knew Travis was not only one tough SOP, but he was also the smartest person on the team by a long shot, which was saying something since Buddy had finished number one at Yale Law back in the day. He flopped one file down on the table. No matter what else happens this spring there is only one thing of paramount importance. By May 15 the young man in this folder must be in the M&M stable. To that end, we're not hiring three new associates, we're hiring one, but paying him the total of all three combined. Hats began to wag, and tongues began to mutter. I know what you're thinking, nobody could be that good, and it would set a terrible precedent with our current and future staff. Well, let me tell you something. This kid is a ducking savant. He most definitely is that smart, and he intends to practice criminal law in Texas. I was in the core with his old man back in the day, and we reconnected about six years ago. I've been following this young man and I can tell you one thing for certain. We don't ever want to be sitting on the other side of the table from him ever. At this point Buddy chimed in. Travis is right folks. All of you will get a copy of his candidate file. At this point he turned in his chair and motioned to his executive assistant, Martha Collins, who was more like the firm's matriarch than admin. Martha, if you would be so kind. As Martha handed each partner their folder Buddy continued. Please don't open them quite yet, this next part is important. Carl Danvers is going to be one of the top five lawyers in the country within 10 years. He's had offers from every serious firm in the USA, six from England, two from Germany and one very, very lucrative Swiss offer. But quite simply, this kid can name his price and work wherever the duck he wants to I'm sorry Martha, please forgive my French, we can't compete with any of these other offers, except for one thing. Carl Danvers fully intends to practice criminal law in his home state, the great state of Texas, and, for some reason known only to God, his old man thinks the world of Travis, and has encouraged his kid to join up with little all us. So Travis concluded, Buddy and I are calling an audible this year. We hope you will read this file tonight, come back in tomorrow and vote that we offer Carl Danvers exactly what is in this contract proposal. 
But whether you vote yes or no, he's our guy and we're going to do everything humanly possible to land him. Fernandez looked up at this last comment he expressed in a combination of surprise and frustration. As a diciendo que los socios principles no time in voto en esto. Yes and no my friend. We most certainly want your support in this soul of you. But at the end of the day buddy and I are agreed. This kid is worth more than we can begin to put down on paper or discuss around this table. At this point Hannah chimed in. So, we vote yes or what? Travis respected everyone around the table. He thought more highly of them than just about anybody else he knew, but he was a no-nonsense kind of guy. Hannah and all of you, we highly value each of you and see you as peers. All of you have been here for 8 years or more, and you know this has never happened before. It likely will never happen again. But this young man is a Michael Jordan or Tiger Woods kind of talent. He will probably end up rewriting the handbook on criminal defense toward. Also, we know if each of you trusts us on this, two things will happen. First, within an hour of meeting him you will be as impressed as Buddy and I secondly. You will thank us profusely for landing him, since his work will have a dramatic impact on the prestige and earning ability of every partner in this firm. So, bottom line, we emphatically want your yes vote. But if for some reason, by this time tomorrow we don't have it there is the door. And that was how Carl Danvers ended up becoming an m, &M in the spring of 2005. At first the partners had huffed a bit on their way out the door with their files. After reading them that evening, they were convinced Buddy and Travis were spot on. After their initial hour with Carl the next afternoon, Travis's two-part prophecy had come true. The 6-0 vote was the biggest no-brainer in the history of M&M. &M. Danvers attacked his role as an associate with an intelligence and intensity befitting his reputation. Many of his co-workers were skeptical at first, but by the end of the summer of 2005, everyone from the top of the firm to the bottom had been enthusiastically won over. Danvers saw inconsistencies others missed. He could read a jury as easily as a comic book. His work in jury selection alone in his first year with the firm accounted for acquittals in three huge cases that netted M&M &M over $2.5 million. His understanding of legal precedents and courtroom maneuvering was uncanny. His thirst for legal knowledge never seemed to be quenched, and folks would often see him in the law library late in the evening or early in the morning. Prosecutors came to loathe him, but every client in the greater Dallas-Fort Worth area who ran afoul of the law wanted him. By the time the dust settled at the end of his third year, M&M's earnings were up over 50%. But what seemed most uncanny to his fellow m and was his humility and kindness. He always had a moment to help a colleague, and he never boasted even when it was clear his work had won the case. He was firm in his convictions and fiercely loyal to his tribe, but nobody ever heard him rant or tear into a colleague. He wasn't perfect, he could become frustrated if others couldn't quite keep up with his thinking, and he had to learn not to assume everyone understood what he was saying. But m, &M was on the map, and this young superstar had put them there. His sixth year with the firm, his first as a full partner, something extraordinary happened. A Fort Worth cop, a detective named Sid Moncrief, was arrested for murdering his wife. Everyone in and around law enforcement in North Texas was shocked. Moncrief had a stellar reputation on the force with several citations and one medal of honor for taking down three rough hombres in a bank heist gone bad. Detective Moncrief had been in the bank when the robbery occurred. Sid shot one and apprehended the other two without any civilian casualties. Some of his buddies started calling him Dirty Harry, but Moncrief just brushed it off as being lucky to have been there to help. He was a cop's cop. Sid and his wife Abby had been married for 16 years, and from what everyone saw the relationship was on very solid ground. This being highly unusual for marriages for cops made it stand out to everyone. Abby was a high school principal and well liked in the district and community. One spring afternoon Abby went missing. Being the wife of a popular detective, her disappearance garnered immediate attention. Bullets went out all over the state, and it seemed every cop, D, FBI, Texas Ranger and good old boy with a shotgun, was helping look for Abby. There was huge grief in the entire community when her body was found in her car off an obscure road outside the small town of Cooper, Texas in the Cooper State Park, about 90 minutes northeast of Dallas. It was even more shocking to the greater DFW area when Detective Sid Moncrief was arrested and charged with first-degree murder in the death of his wife Abby. Nobody could believe it, but the TBI, Texas Bureau of Investigation, appeared to have ironclad evidence. This is where the story got interesting. Moncrief had respect but no love for Carl Danvers. Danvers had beaten the Fort Worth DA on several cases in which Moncrief was the lead investigator. He never seen anyone like Danvers in all his years on the force. It was clear he was always two steps ahead of everyone else in the courtroom including the judge. Moncrief knew he was innocent, and 99.9% .9 of the force agreed. 
but the TBI had strong forensic and DNA evidence, along with a couple of eyewitnesses that placed the detective in the car with his wife only an hour before her disappearance. It was also discovered that Moncrief's family owned property in that area as far back as the late 1800s. It was determined that the murder was committed on that property, and then the car was driven to the remote area and abandoned. Moncrief was being held in county lockup while awaiting a bond hearing. He was in solitary away from the Gen Pop for his own safety. Two hours before his bail hearing the detective was sitting in his cell trying to figure out how to afford a decent lawyer, when one of the guards came to collect him. It's not time for my hearing Mike, what's up? Sid asked. Mike Kelly just smiled, hey Con, just shut up and follow me. WTF, thought Moncrief. When he entered the interrogation room, he was greeted by none other than Carl Danvers, who stood and held out his hand. Sid I'm very sorry to see you under the circumstances, but hope that I might have a few minutes of your time. Moncrief was too shocked to speak, he just sat down, finally managing, sure counselor. Danvers jumped in. Sid, I don't know if you have counsel or not, but I'd like to represent you in this case. My guess is, you tolerate guys like me, but don't like us much, since most of the time we're on opposite sides of the table. But thanks to a friend who will remain nameless, I've seen the evidence and have come to two conclusions. Moncrief didn't interrupt. First, you didn't murder Abby. By the way, I am very sorry for your loss. I cannot imagine what you're going through on that front. And secondly, I know, beyond a shadow of a doubt if I don't represent you, you'll go to prison for the rest of your life. So, I'd like to take your case. Sid was completely dumbfounded. Mr. Danvers, thank you for your condolences and your offer. But I could never afford you to even represent me at the arraignment, much less the trial. Could I ask why you've concluded I didn't kill my wife? Sid, if you can scrape together ten grand, I'll take your case. That way both of us can hold up our heads. You won't be taking charity, and I'll have the honor of safeguarding one of the best cops in our town. As far as how I know this, it is simple. You murdering your wife doesn't make any sense. Our firm has an extensive investigation crew, and in the last 48 hours I had them do some very specific digging. You had a good marriage, no fooling around, two people who've been in love since high school. You and I both know detective that when something doesn't make sense, there's a rat somewhere. But we also know when two and two add up to four, there is no point in trying to disprove something that is obviously true. It is obvious to me, there is no way in hell you murdered Abby. So, Sid, can you dig up ten grand in the next three months? Right then and there one of the oddest partnerships in the history of Texas criminal justice began. Two hours later Judge Hector Sanchez was a bit full mucks with the bailiff announced the People vs. Sid Moncrief on the charge of murder in the first degree, and from the back of the courtroom a strong voice rang out, Carl Danvers for the defense your honor. Every cop in the area was shocked to learn Danvers was representing one of their own. But when they learned their brother needed help with half of the 10k fee the kitty was filled before the end of the day's shift. To say their investment was well spent would be the understatement of the decade. Nine months later when Sid Moncrief went on trial for murder one in the death of his wife Carl Danvers became the Michael Jordan, Wayne Gretzky and Peyton Manning of the courtroom, all rolled up into one. For the first part of the trial the prosecution, led by young hotshot Tyson Goddard, trotted what witnesses they had, which were few. Most of their evidence was circumstantial, but some of it was pretty damning. For his part Danvers sat jotting down a few notes here and there, but for most of the time he simply seemed disinterested. He would ask the occasional question on cross, or object now and then, but rarely did he even pay serious attention to anything any of the witnesses shared. The lone exception was Captain Paul Brennan. An old school Irish cop Brennan was no nonsense. He said he hated that a man as good as Moncrief could have been driven to murder his wife. He insisted Sid was a good cop and a better man. It appeared he hated testifying for the prosecution and did so reluctantly. Uncrossed Danvers seemed very interested on Brennan's interaction with Moncrief on the day of the killing. Did he talk to the detective that morning before or after roll call? Was he giving Sid any direction on any of the cases on which he and his partner were working? Had he seen Detective Moncrief at the end of his shift? It turned out the captain had taken a sick day that day for a doctor's appointment, and had no idea of Moncrief's actions or whereabouts. As it turned out Danvers had good reason for bringing up the captain's absence that day. Once the defense began Carl was focused, succinct and on the attack. Witness after witness, expert after expert, cops, firemen, neighbors, and other associates were called on to demonstrate that it was both physically and emotionally impossible for Moncrief to kill his wife. Once he'd set that table, he began to feast on the true order of events as he understood them. He was like a starving dog on a bone. He put each building block of his argument together meticulously piece by piece. At one point Sid looked over at the jury box, and would later describe what he saw as 12 men and women, mesmerized by brilliance. 
When he was done after two days of establishing what really happened, the judge looked at the demoralized prosecuting attorney Goddard and simply said, Well, counselor. Goddard rose to his feet, buttoned his suit coat, and in the immortal words of Jim Trotter III said, Your Honor, the state would like to dismiss all charges. Every cop but one attending the trial jumped to their feet and cheered. The lone exception was Captain Paul Brennan, who was trying to make his way out the back door, when two detectives from his squad confronted him. Paul Brennan, you are under arrest for the murder of Abby Moncrief. You have the right to remain silent. Nine months earlier, acting on his gut instinct and investing $25,000 of his own money, Carl Danvers had set out on a mission to free his innocent client and help the cops bring the real killer to justice. He and his team had tirelessly followed every lead possible. They looked under every rock possible until they discovered Abby and Captain Paul were having an affair. As it turned out, Abby was feeling the weight of guilt and had confided in her piece of sheep lover, she was going to come clean with her husband. Two days later, she was dead, having never told her husband she had lost her way and was a lying cheat. Danvers' own wife Mandy had given him every reason to hate cheaters. He knew of one six-month affair that had ended a few months earlier when her Latin lover up and disappeared one day without a word. However, Mandy was nothing if not unfaithful, so she began seeing another guy within weeks. Some scumbag from the Dallas area named Nick Santos had caught Mandy's eye. Tall good-looking but a mile wide and an inch deep when it came to brains. Danvers knew what he had to do and carefully executed his plan. He had given her time to come to her senses after her first tryst, but now that the pattern was established, he put his plan in motion. He confronted Santos and his wife in a hotel room. Santos knocked him to the ground and ran away like the kitty he was. Carl let him go, knowing the piece of trash's fate was already sealed. However, Danvers' wife had played the, I'll take the kids and destroy you financially in the divorce route. Carl wasn't sure why his wife was both unrepentant and so stupid at the same time. She knew her husband was smart, but clearly, she underestimated him. Nick Santos was gone too. But he hadn't disappeared. He'd been found dead from a drug overdose in a hotel room in Minneapolis. If Mandy was half as smart as she was horny, she may have suspected something, but it turned out she was about as dumb as a rock. During the trial Carl had continued to put the pieces of the puzzle together for dealing with his cheating bride. He'd hired a divorce attorney once his wife decided to file and asked him to just drag it out for a while. Danvers was living in a nice apartment about two blocks from his office and had their three kids every weekend. He adored his children and they, him. It wasn't that they didn't love their mom, but fortunately they had each inherited some of their daddy's brains and they knew instinctively he was a good and solid man. They were young, now 8, 10 and 13, but they knew it appeared to be over between their parents. They cried, but they also had a solid foundation and, in their dad's case, a rock-solid parent. They would survive the storm. Carl was certain with the right love and direction they'd be okay. It was time to put the final part of his plan in motion. Carl called Manny five days after the trial on a Tuesday. She at least had the decency to compliment him on his victory. Carl intentionally sounded a bit tired and asked Mandy if she could come by the office for a face-to-face, -face, no attorneys just the two of them. Not being the sharpest pencil in the box, Mandy deduced Carl was about to cave and give her everything she and her shark lawyer had demanded. She agreed to the meeting which was set for Friday afternoon at 4, when all the partners and most of the associates would be already heading out for the weekend. When she arrived, she sauntered into his office with all the confidence of Joe named the few days before Super Bowl III. Self-assured, she plopped down in the easy chair as Carl stood leaning against his desk. He almost felt sorry for her. Almost. So, Mandy, I thought it would be best if the two of us brought some closure to our negotiations in the divorce. I assume you're ready to get on with your life. I know I am. Sure Carl, Mandy smirked, just sign the petition my lawyer gave you, and we can go our separate ways. Sorry Mandy, but that is never going to happen. I thought I'd do you the courtesy of telling you face to face what is going to happen in the next 30 minutes. Duck you Carl, Mandy spat. I can't believe you brought me here to waste my time. She rose to leave. Sit the duck down Mandy, Carl replied in an even tone that sent a chill down her spine, but she tried to keep what she thought was the upper hand. And if I don't cucky, what are you going to do about it? At that moment a panel behind Carl's desk opened and a very well-dressed Asian man stepped into the office. He came and stood about five feet from Mandy, between her and the door. If you don't, I'll turn you over to my associate Mr. Bando. He is very good at his craft. Mr. Bando perused Mandy stokely. That sent another chill down her spine. How Mandy replied, trying to sound brave, but she sat back down. Okay, I'll play your silly game for a few minutes. So, what is going to happen Mr. Danvers? I'm going to give you two options Mandy and you will choose one of them. Option 1 you take a trip out of town for the next 6 months, and you work for a friend of mine in New York City. 
My associate, who will remain nameless, owns several businesses, one of which is high-end prostitutes. Since you love to duck around so much, you can make a few bucks spreading your slot legs. Mandy looked incredulous. Why on earth would I do such a vile thing? Funny you think ducking for money is vile, but betraying those you claim to love by sleeping around is okay. You have one duck up sense of right and wrong which. The reason you'll do this is twofold. First, because I'm demanding payment from you for the pain and suffering you've caused me. Secondly you owe me for the pain you caused our children. You don't get to play the whore and then walk away with half of my possessions and primary custody of our children. For six months you will be a paid prostitute and duck whomever your pimp tells you to duck in whatever manner she says. Mandy's eyebrow arched. Yes, that's right, your handler will be a woman. I insisted upon that with my colleague. He found that amusing. Your life for the next six months will be in her hands. I'm told you will have no fewer than six dates per week. Some are older men, some are younger. Several are significantly overweight and enjoy angry sex. Some will be in groups and others will be solo. None of your cheating holes will be off limits, and I'm led to believe some of my friend's clients have some very kinky notions of pleasure. At the end of the six months, if the STDs don't get you, you will return to Dallas, sign the divorce papers I've drawn up, and we will then part company. You will get to see the children two Saturdays per month and two weeks out of the summer. After one year, if they want more time with you, I won't deny them. Mandy was trembling now because even she was smart enough to know Carl was deadly serious. You crazy. Several people saw me come in today and two of my friends know I'm here. I thought you were so smart, but you'd never get away with this. Carl said nothing but looked at Bando. As he moved toward Mandy, she flinched. The Asian calmly took a phone out of his pocket, clicked a couple of keys, and handed the phone to Mandy. For the next five minutes she watched and listened to the death of Nick Santos. She was beyond mortified. When it was over a woman appeared from the same hidden panel door from which Bando had emerged. She was the same body shape as Mandy. She had the same color hair and complexion. She wore the identical outfit Mandy had on. She stood silently as Carl continued. My dear cheating wife, everyone who saw you arrive will see you leave just as you came in. Your friends will be called, and they will hear your voice tell them everything is okay, and you're headed out to dinner with Jim, your new stuck to her body. If they are questioned, they will say exactly that, because that is what they will believe. Veronica here is a very accomplished impersonator, and I have no doubt she will be convincing. Mandy realized her options were shrinking by the moment. Her husband truly was a genius, and she should have been much more cautious. You said there are two options. What is the other? If I refuse to become a whore Mr. Bando here sticks a needle in me, and I'm dead in a matter of moments. I'd never allow you to be that lucky Mandy. If you refuse, Mr. Bando does stick a needle in you, but you don't die. You'll wake up in a foreign country. Maybe Mexico, perhaps Brazil or even Ukraine where you will live and work in a local whorehouse until you die. You can be serious. Mandy exclaimed, her clammy hands beginning to shake. I'm deadly serious Count. Carl replied with such an evil look she had to divert her eyes. You crushed my heart Mandy, and you've destroyed our family all for cheap sex. As I said, you don't get to walk away. No way on God's green earth I let you feel a small prick, and then drift off to the other side, never experiencing the type of pain you've caused. You don't get off that easy. If you refuse option 1, Mr. Bando will sedate you, and you'll wake up in a very dark place where you will be used and then thrown away. You'll never see your children again. In time, you will only be a vague memory to them. You'll never see a graduation, wedding, or birth of a grandchild, if you think I'm bluffing and force me to use option 2. Don't believe for one second, I won't. The Dallas PD will poke around for a while asking questions and doing a bit of an investigation. They will see you were here then left. Your friends will talk of their last conversation with you and how you seem perfectly fine. Boy Toy will testify you called and cancelled dinner. No one, least of all me, will ever be prosecuted for your disappearance, since no foul play will ever be proved. In short, all of us will get on with our lives. But not you Mandy. Nobody will look for you, nobody will come to your rescue. You'll be all alone getting ducked 8 to 10 times per day by some of the filthiest people around. You won't live 2 years in that setting. The STDs will get you long before then, and there will be no doctor's care, no medical assistance. Just you dying in some back alley somewhere completely alone. All you will have will be the memory of what you had, and how you pissed it all away to die a whore death. To say Mandy was shell-shocked would be an understatement. She'd walked in so confident, sure she would enjoy rubbing Carl's nose in her adultery, betrayal, and getting at least half of every penny he earned. She had entered a proud strong woman, but was now realizing the adage, pride goes before a fall was way too close to home. She was desperately trying to think of a way out, and her eyes gave her away. Mr. Bandos, it would appear my soon-to-be ex-wife will be taking option number two. 
Please dispose of this trash so I can conclude my business and go home to my kids. As Bandos reached for the kit that held the syringe, Mandy realized she'd lost. No, I'll take option one, she said just above a whisper. I'm sorry Mandy, Carl replied, I couldn't hear you. She wanted to glare at him, spit in his face, maybe even slap him, but any fight in her was gone. Option two made her freeze with fear. I'll take option one, do my six months and return to Dallas. That's the first intelligent decision you've made in a long time Mandy, was all Carl said before she felt the needle enter her neck. Epilogue. Mandy woke up in New Jersey and did her six months work. She was surprisingly compliant and made the best of her situation. Her handler, known only to her as Meyer, was fair and didn't abuse her. At first, she hated men using her for their pleasure. She was their slot, their duck toy to play with as they pleased, and many of them had vivid imaginations when it came to sex. At least once a week she endured two or three partners at a time. Many nights she would cry herself to sleep feeling the cheapness of what she had become to pay for her blatant infidelity. As time went on, she became accustomed to her work and put the best face she could on paying her debt. As it turned out many of her johns gave her nice gifts, and often tipped her very well. Two even proposed marriage. It was hard and she continually fell deep shame, but she realized her challenges were nothing compared to what option two would have meant. Somehow she had avoided some of the nastier STDs. She returned to Dallas, perhaps not a changed woman, but certainly not the selfish witch she had been upon her departure. Her children were cautious, but glad to see her. They warmed up to her over the next few months, and much of what they had was restored. Carl kept his word about her time with him. She didn't touch another man for over five years, and sold most of her trinkets to a local pawn shop. She eventually began tentatively dating. Carl had been correct. With his carefully crafted cover story, the cops didn't look too hard, and when she returned, she told the story Myra demanded she memorize and stick to. Right before she left New York Myra said, Mandy, we'll keep close tabs on you. One false move, one attempt to tell the authorities what has happened, and you'll wake up in option two. Mandy decided discretion was the better part of wisdom, and kept to her cover story of a long-term stint in rehab. She had changed so much, the story seemed perfectly logical to everyone. Carl got on with his life and continued a very successful legal career. He never remarried. The scars were just too deep. He did however, meet a wonderful woman named Liz, who delighted in being close with him on his terms. That's it for today's story, my friends. Don't forget to like and subscribe before you leave and I'll see you in the next video.